Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the latest live round. I hope you're enjoying them so far. Um, I've got my name is Dr. Paul Chadwick, and I work at the College of Podiatry. And I've got with me my colleague today, Dr. Helen Branthwaite, who's an expert in musculoskeletal podiatry and works at the University of Staffordshire. So we're going to show you a short video in a few moments, um, but we're going to take questions. And I would encourage you to put questions in uh, the, either the chat box or in the Q&A function um, during the presentation. And we can pick them up and try and answer your questions at the end, hopefully. If we don't get to answer your questions today, we'll try and get back to you at some point with, with some answers. So without much further ado, I'll hand over now and we'll get to start the video. Hi, my name's Paul Chadwick. I'm the clinical director at the College of Podiatry. I'm gratefully here with um, Dr. Helen Branthway, who's an MSK podiatrist from Staffordshire University, uh, where she's uh, the lead for the MSc in clinical biomechanics. We've been asked lots of questions through our Legs Matter um, website and forum around heel pain, and uh, Dr. Branthway is an expert in this particular area. So we'd be very honored to have her here today to have some questions and uh, answer my questions. And hopefully later we'll be in the live lounge where she can answer your questions as well. So Helen, just to kick us off, um, just tell us how common is heel pain? Well, it's probably one of the most common problems that are presented to podiatrists around the foot and ankle, um, with about 40% of caseloads in MSK podiatry, which is podiatrists that deal specifically with injuries and function. Um, but there's data to suggest that 9% of the population suffer with heel pain at some time in their life. Now, um, there's lots of different diagnoses for heel pain, um, but out of a prevalence of that 9%, one in five people take time off work when they, they have heel pain. So it significantly impacts people's lives and is uh, a serious enough problem for them to take some time off work. Um, but like I say, or I alluded to just a minute ago, there's many different types of heel pain and there's different reasons why people get heel pain. And dependent on the pathology and the diagnosis of your heel pain, that will uh, influence your recovery and, and what type of problem that you, you've experienced. So um, a lot of it is uh, dependent on a number of factors, but it's a significant problem that could affect a number of us in day-to-day -day life. Thanks, Helen. I mean, you, you mentioned there about that there was some common reasons for heel pain. If you could just describe, say, perhaps the, the most common reasons that people would get heel pain and why they would see a podiatrist. So the, the, the most common pe reason people get heel pain is something that a lot of you may have already heard of. It's a, a term that's familiar in, in common language and you may already know of somebody who's had a diagnosis of plantar fasciitis. Now, this term has been the uh, key diagnosis for heel pain for many, and a lot of medics will make an initial diagnosis of plantar fasciitis in the heel. But actually, current research has shown that uh, plantar fascial pain, or pain of the fascia, which is connective tissue, doesn't have an inflammatory nature to it. And anything with an itis on the end in medical terms implies that there is an inflammatory nature. So more recently, it's an accepted term that any injury to the fascia is termed as a fasciopathy or more commonly referred to as plantar heel pain. Um, and that's in line with the presenting pathology, which tends not to be inflammatory in nature. So that's probably the most common diagnosis, but there are many other reasons people present with heel pain. And the key thing is to get the right diagnosis because the assumption that everybody with heel pain has plantar fasciopathy or uh, fascial pain uh, leads to uh, a lot of poor, poor outcomes because the treatments are different for each different type of heel pain. So if the diagnosis isn't made accurately, then the patient then tends to have a poor outcome and ends up with uh, the pain persisting. So if we were to think about the structures in the heel, there are four main structures that can constitute a heel. Uh, one of the, the, the key ones being the bone, the heel bone or the calcaneus, um, and then a number of tendons that uh, work the ankle joints and other joints in the rear foot. Uh, so the main one being the Achilles tendon, which inserts at the back of the heel. And then there's quite a number of tendons underneath the foot 
that run from the heel bone, the calcaneus, along the plantar surface of the foot, along the sole of the foot into the toes. And often heel pain can be from a tendon problem with those muscles in the foot as well. So there's, there's problems to the bone, problems to the soft tissue or the tendons, um, which mainly include the Achilles tendon and the short flexor tendons that run underneath the sole of your foot. And then there can be problems to nerves that innervate the foot. So that can be a compression of the nerve around the ankle bone, which is known as tarsal tunnel. But there also can be a peripheral irritation to the nerve. Uh, and there's a, a small nerve that uh, leads into the heel called the Baxter's nerve, which can get trapped and cause a, a pain there. And then also with heel pain, it is really not uncommon for people to have a, a problem further up the leg, more commonly in the back, which causes a referred pain into the heel. And I often explain this like a, a, a kink in a lead. So your light switch might not go on or your, your, your light might blow, your bulb might blow, but it could be due to a faulty fuse or a, a problem with the plug at the other end of that. And nerves act very similarly. So the presentation may be that you have a pain in the heel, but actually it could be caused by an issue further up in the, the leg and the back, which you may not necessarily have a problem with. So there, it's a very complex area and mechanically, which is an area that we specialize in, uh, in biomechanics. So looking at the function of how a human structure works, the, the ankle joint is unique, really. It's probably one of the few joints where you have a 90 degree bend in the structures that go around it. So the tissues from the bone and the leg, uh, the, the skin, the vessels, the nerves all have to go round 90 degrees to continue into the foot. And as a mechanical function in the human body, that causes the majority of the problem. So um, the main reasons that those structures I've just spoken about get injured is because of this uh, mechanical uh, deficit or change in force around the ankle. Uh, as people do their day-to-day -day living, walking and running. Um, so the main reason that people get pain and injury to those tissues is that they are either overusing it or they have a direct injury to the heel and the ankle from an activity that they're doing. And that might be a sporting activity if they're keen at running or other sports that often cause heel problems. But running definitely comes to mind. One of the most common injuries for runners is Achilles tendon problems. Um, but also people's professions, if you're standing an awful lot, plantar heel pain has got a positive correlation with those people that stand for a profession. So factory workers or um, other professions where there is an awful lot of static standing and also people that use ladders quite a bit. So there can be an increase in strain on the ankle joint when you're up and down a ladder. So a number of factors can contribute to those tissues around the ankle becoming traumatized and injured, which leads to this multitude of uh, pathologies being diagnosed. Then the other thing that's very, very often observed when people have heel pain is a change in activity. So the most common um, demographic of people who have heel pain and particularly plantar heel pain, the common one which is often referred to as plantar fasciitis, that is reported to mainly affect women, middle-aged, that tend to have a little bit more inactivity and possibly some overweight uh, issues there as well. Not the primary cause, but tends to be reported as an issue. And one of the reasons for that is there's often a change in habits that those people make. So that might be, and I'm making many assumptions here, but it is an, ob an observation that is often seen, is that there may be a change in footwear habits and they've gone to more recreational shoes, from maybe a heeled shoe, 
um, they haven't got the sufficient strength in their calf muscle and foot to take the extra load that increased range of movement would incur from the forces of changing to different footwear. Uh, so therefore the tissue gets strained. And actually over this lockdown period in my own clinical practice and in others, I've certainly seen an increase in heel pain presentations from people who have been home working and not wearing shoes and pottering around the house barefooted and they're not used to that and they haven't necessarily got the strength in their foot to overcome the increased torque and strain around the ankle joint uh, and therefore they injure the structures. So there's definitely been an increase in prevalence in heel pain um, around the, the lockdown period where pay, people's working habits have changed. They're perhaps not as active, not walking to the train station, not commuting and taking um, a walk into work. Uh, and certainly this habit of being at home, um, wear, not wearing your work gear, therefore your, sh your shoes has changed, I think is, is a, a primary cause of this increase that I, I particularly observed uh, over the last six months. Um, so yeah, the, so it's, <laughs> it's a, a really complex situation, isn't it? And I think the primary thing to do is to really get a good diagnosis because there are so many pathologies that can cause heel pain. Yeah, that's great, Helen. I mean, I, I reflect on that uh, lack of um, wearing shoes during the past six months. Yeah, I don't think I've moved from this um, fireplace for the past six months. So uh, <laughs> I'm sure when I start walking again, I'll get the heel pain. So, um, so you talk very much about what the causes and the and the reasons for heel pain are. How can people sort of prevent getting these problems in the first place? How can people prevent heel problems? Okay, so I mean, the the main thing that we see and observe as therapists and podiatrists is that there's a lack of strength in the calf muscles and the, what we call the intrinsic foot muscles. So those are the short muscles that go from the heel to the toes and they primarily flex the toes. But during walking, they act as like an anchor and a grounding to keep the foot stiff so that you are able to, bod your body weight is able to propel forward from that. So they play a very postural role in just normal walking. And that's one of the, the issues around um, recovering from this is that unlike your wrist or your shoulder or other places in the body that you injure, um, you're not really able to stop using your feet unless it's very dire and, and you literally can't take your body weight through it but most people wouldn't necessarily comply with wearing an offloading uh, cast or something similar to prevent them from taking their body weight through it so going back to what you've said about prevention then it's definitely about keeping yourself physically active and keeping the foot mobile and strong using the toes and the digits in the way that they were originally designed for. Um, I think a lot of people mainly just walk and that increases the, the extension and flexion, but it doesn't really use the, the digits around the, the ball of the foot, the metatarsals as they were for a grip. We don't frequently use our toes to grip many things. So improving the strength of the foot and also the strength of the ankle joint, that's mainly the calf muscle and the load that goes through the Achilles tendon is probably one of the primary ways to keep away heel pain. And they're not making drastic changes to lifestyle without appropriate training. So one of the key things in runners, um, I mentioned earlier that Achilles tendon problems are the most prevalent running injury. And often that's because people um, continue to train at high intensity. Uh, they have a, a lack of adherence to rest and rehabilitation. Um, and then maybe the footwear choice isn't appropriate for their foot posture and mechanics. So there's a number of errors that people make in, um, in particularly in, in running. Uh, there's a, an increase Running is one of the most frequently observed exercises that people do, and it's probably the most frequently less trained. So people don't particularly get advice on how to run. If you were to take up swimming and you'd never swam before, you certainly would take lessons and coaching to actually engage in that physical activity. But it's not observed in running. People take it 
as a God-forgiven right that they can run down the road. And I know in our family car, it's quite amusing when we're traveling around and see runners, my children have become professionals in, in digesting different running techniques to, to, <laughs> to sort of say oh, what they're doing wrong and stuff. So people don't tend to engage in that type of coaching and training around it. Therefore, a lot of training errors are made and the ankle and the Achilles tendon tend to be the, the, um, the spot that breaks first and you get a lot of overuse injuries around there. And then even though people tend to rest as, as you would do if you'd got a lot of pain in that area, you take some rest, but then you don't increase the strength or rehabilitate it back to a good point to return to running. So I think another way of preventing it is to be compliant with treatment regimes, um, invest in some coaching and training for returning to running uh, and, and, and having some uh, willpower and patience about doing that uh, and definitely not being invincible listening to your body so if you have a pain in resting it rather than continuing in and making more damage to that um, but also just having a, an awareness of the type of footwear that you choose and seeking advice to whether that's the correct type of footwear for you to be using whether that's for a workplace activity or a sporting activity as well. And podiatrists are well placed to give out footwear advice. It's our bread and butter. We, we use uh, footwear in, in our treatment protocols anyway. So having advice from a podiatrist around the right type of shoes to wear is definitely a prevention strategy. Brilliant, thank you. And what should people do if they do develop heel pain? What's the first, what's the plan of action for that if you get the heel pain? Okay, so, so again, dependent on what the diagnosis is, it, it, it's not very often that heel pain comes acutely and unless you fall off something and then you've got a direct reason for having that pain. So sometimes people do say, oh, I slipped off a curb or I stepped funny and it's been sore ever since. Um, but more often than not, all the conditions I've spoken about in the last 10, 15 minutes come on very, very slowly. Um, so they come on gradually, people tend to ignore it, and then it interferes with their activity. So it interferes with what you're wanting to do. And that tends to be the reason why people seek out attention. And my advice as a, as a therapist and working in research would be maybe to seek advice a bit sooner, um, because quite often when patients do arrive uh, for podiatry or uh, rehabilitation therapies, their, their, their trauma is quite chronic in nature and that makes our job much harder to get them back to a pain-free level. So by all means, sit and wait for a few days to see if the pain recedes on its own. But if it's, it's persisting more than a week, I would certainly encourage people to seek advice. Um, and the, the prime thing would be to, to get an accurate diagnosis to what the pain is. And that can be done with a number of, of clinical tests that podiatrists know about. Some of them can be gait analysis things, looking at the function of how the foot and ankle move, um, taking some measurements around strength and function of the ankle joints and foot. But they also may use some diagnostic tests like uh, some ultrasound imaging, very similar to what we use to look at babies in pregnant women. Um, we use ultrasound more and more to look at tissue and it's a non-invasive procedure, so there's no risk of radiation or anything with that. And particularly for plantar heel pain, one of the observations uh, that we know with people that have it, if they get, they get a thickening of the fascia, the connective tissue underneath the foot, um, that becomes much thicker. And therefore, having an image scan of that part of your heel can give you a clear diagnosis that you have that uh, plantar heel pain. Um, and we know then when you get a thickened fascia that the stiffness of that tissue reduces as well. So that therefore reduces the function of your foot. So then the treatments that are involved are aimed at stabilizing that condition so that you can get healing of any damage to the structures and that will in, in turn reduce the pain. So there are a number of therapies that can be implemented for all those conditions I've spoken about. Um, and they're related to the diagnosis. So the primary thing is to get the diagnosis right. 
And then most probably um, you will get issued some exercises to improve the, the stiffness of the structures in your foot and leg um, and also the strength. Um, so stretches are often used. They don't actually lengthen tendons. We, we, do, we don't want to lengthen tendons. That's really not a good thing. But what they do is they change the way the function of the muscle works and the way that the muscle engages in movement for normal activities. So strengthening and stretching exercises are very, very often prescribed for heel pain. And then there are a number of other therapies like acupuncture might be used or taping um, to restrict movement if that's a, a, an issue. And then education about health and working habits, footwear choices, as I've already explained, um, that, that, that can be done. And then more, common, uh, more recently, there's been some strong evidence to using a shockwave therapy, um, which is using a, an electrical machine to actually increase the healing by putting shock waves through the tissues. So there are a number of podiatrists that would possibly offer that for pain management as well. But the, the conversation is between the patient and the, the, the podiatrist, and it needs to be uh, a match to whatever that patient's uh, goals are. So their, their objective in reducing the pain primarily, but it might also be that I can only get to one mile before the pain comes and the treatment then might um, advance that so that you can get to three, four, five miles if you're a runner. Similarly, somebody might say, well, I can't get out of bed without getting pain and, and that's really uncomfortable for me. So often it's a conversation and a fluid conversation that needs to meet the therapist, the podiatrist needs as well uh, as the patient to, uh, in, in agreeing a suitable treatment plan that, that engages everybody's um, goals and assumptions about treating that effectively. Oh, brilliant. Well, thanks, Helen. That was brilliant. The last 20 minutes, I've learned so much, and I'm sure most of the people listening have learned very much as well. Um, I'm going to say goodbye now, and thank, but thank you very much, and hopefully we'll see you for some live questions in the live lounge after this is finished. Thank you very much again. Okay, thank you. Hi, everybody. This is the technology getting used to this, but um, I've just seen there's got quite a lot of questions coming through, so I'll do our best to get through them in the next um, 10 minutes. I'm actually uh, Janine's asked the first question is uh, Helen which I hope we can help with which is do insoles help and what kinds of insoles are best? Yeah certainly um, so podiatrists frequently prescribe insoles or orthotics the terms used interchangeably um, and the main aim of that is to change the way the moments around the ankle occur and um, so quite often a heel raise is administered um, as part of the prescription of the insole. So there are some off the shelf products that you can purchase from different outlets that would possibly give you some uh, initial relief, um, but primarily you need to have a full assessment to, to get a prescription um, set up for you that's relative to your foot mechanics. So the main aim of an insole is to alter the loading on the tissue possibly implement some shock absorbency if that's required uh, and then alter the proprioception and then the movement pattern that you engage in. Um, so just buying insoles off the shelf without having an assessment of what the problem is can sometimes be fatal and I think has led to a uh, lack of faith in what insoles actually do. So you need to make sure that you've got the right insole for your condition but yeah they definitely have a, a place in treating heel pain. So yeah, to, to summarise that, it's really about making sure you see a podiatrist or a therapist to get a, an accurate diagnosis before even contemplating insoles. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you can just use off the shelf ones uh, like generically to, to start, but if it doesn't improve, then it's most likely that it's not the right type of insole for your condition. So I would seek out some assistance there. And if somebody then, you know, if you saw a podiatrist and they said, or oh, I'm going to give you an insole, don't feel disheartened that you've tried one and it's not particularly worked. It's most likely that the off the shelf one you bought wasn't relevant to your complaint and wasn't specific enough to address the mechanical deficits that you presented with. Okay, fantastic. And I think looking at the, some of the questions, we've got a couple of nurses on the um, uh, call. So I'll, I'll take a couple of those. Going. One is I get heel pain after a 12 hour shift standing and walking. How can I avoid the pain and prevention of the heel pain? I'm always mobile when I'm on the ward. Okay, so I would imagine doing an awful lot of walking around, 
So I would probably relate that to the footwear that that, that patient or that person's having to wear. So nurses have to, to wear a certain set of shoes. So they can sometimes be restricted in that. And if they're working on a ward, again, the floors are quite hard and not very forgiving. So maybe have a look at the footwear the flatter the shoe is, the more strain is put around the heel and the ankle. Um, so have a look at the inclination of the shoe. Uh, so it doesn't mean that you've got to go out and wear heeled shoes because that's clearly not appropriate for nursing tasks. But looking at the difference between the heel and the front of the shoe and looking at the inclination angle of the uh, midfoot. So it's what we term in footwear as having a heel drop or a stack. But if you look at a wedge shoe, you've got an inclination to that um, shoe profile. Something like that is going to relieve um, the forces and tension around the back of the foot. Um, and there's some footwear on the market there, fit flops particularly, they're, they're designed such to transfer load and alter that. So there's, I, I would potentially say that the footwear will help to alleviate that uh, problem over that long period, but it's it's a common observation that people that stand for their job over a long period are more likely to get heel pain. Um, so I suppose adding on to that and the, the advice we gave in the, the, the talk there is uh, looking at the strength of your foot and the power that you have in your foot and ankle to enable you to do that. So if you likened it to a marathon runner, a marathon runner has done a lot of training to run 26.2 miles. Um, uh, how much exercises do you do to strengthen the foot to enable you to stand for 12 hour shifts? So there might be a correlation there about conditioning of the leg muscles and keeping them strong. And I don't mean just being able to walk. I mean, how many toe raises can you do? Can you grip a piece of paper? Can you stand on one leg and go up onto your toes? Those are all sorts of uh, key movements that indicate how strong or weak the foot and leg are. Brilliant. And I think there's another one from a, a, a healthcare professional and it's again, it's a, it relates to one of the potential causes. And I think at the time we were talking about plantar fasciopathy. So she said, the, it's Mandy who says this, she said, I have this and I was told it's where I, I presume that's kneel to do patients' legs. So is, is there a correlation um, yeah. between kneeling and the heel pain? Yeah, I mean, it's not a common observation, but yeah, you, again, you see it in other professions like electricians or plumbers that are down on the floor or somebody like that. So when you kneel, you actually put your ankle in a large amount of stress. Um, so you generally have the toes flexed and then you're bending maximally at the ankle. So that puts all the structures underneath the plantar sole of the foot on tension really. So if you're in that position for a long period of time and you've injured a structure, then you're not able to offload it. So I'd suggest maybe sitting cross-legged um, or having a little stool to sit on so that you're not putting the force through the foot, but it tends to be that kneeling position where the toes are flexed and then you, your ankles fully flex. I'm doing it as I say, <laughs> even though I'm sat on a chair and sort of going, and, and this is how you flex your ankle. So yeah, perhaps sitting um, with the feet out to the side or cross leg, which not ideal, but maybe a little stool to sit on while you, you, you attending to the patient's legs might help you with that. Right. I'm realising we're nearly out of time. So I suppose rather than that, we've got many questions and I don't think we do them justice and trying to rush through them. So I suppose but my last question was, what are the main take home messages about heel pain for, for the audience? Oh, gosh. Sorry. Um, I would... <laughs> thanks for that one. <laughs> um, watch the webinar again. <laughs> no, uh, look at your footwear. That is a key thing for heel pain. Make sure it's suitable for the activity that you're doing and that it's suitable for the strength and posture within your foot. Uh, invest in strengthening your foot. Most people's feet don't work as they should do. They're not able to splay the toes. They're not able to grip with the foot. Um, picking up socks, tissues off the floor. They're not able to do that. Going up onto your tiptoes, how many times can you bounce up and down onto your tiptoes? Have you got enough power and endurance in your calf muscles? Uh, can you balance on one leg? All these sorts of things that are related to dysfunction because we tend not to practice them that much. So investing in strength like that 
I'm not saying it will cure the heel pain, but it certainly will make uh, the prevalence of it much less for you. So those sorts of things, footwear and strength and training for the, the leg and foot muscles. Great, thanks very much, Alan. Um, there has been a lot of questions, and as I said, I think we'll struggle to get through them. We will try and answer them on the website if we can. Um, alternatively, please do go and see a podiatrist who will be able to give you specific uh, advice for your individual problems. And, and I'd like to say good night, and thanks, Helen, for the uh, contribution. It's been excellent, and I hope everyone's enjoyed this session. Thanks, Helen. Okay, thank you.